Testing, one, two, three, hello. Testing, one, two, three, hello. Hello. Can, Can uh, people, uh, hear, people me? hear me? Maybe I'll use the opportunity to first introduce Josh and Matt. So Josh and Matt are uh, co-authors on the editorial that we wrote. And uh, maybe uh, they can just say a few words about themselves. Yep, I'm here. Um, well, thanks. I'm glad the editorial has uh, generated some interest. And um, when I was editor of uh, MRM from 2011 through 2019, uh, reproducible research and open science was um, always an interest of mine. And I'm glad to see it's gaining momentum. And I look for great things in the future also. Thanks for your support. Uh, Josh? Great. Yep, and then uh, I'm one of the deputy editors for MRM who manages a lot of the imagery construction and now some of the emerging artificial intelligence applications. And I'm also fairly involved in the reconstruction community in the IEEE and signal processing aspects there. So uh, coming at it from a little bit different perspective of the communities and some of the neuroimaging folks and whatnot, but that's kind of where we wanted to make sure there was this broad perspective uh, incorporated into the editorial and whatnot. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so I think we can just start with uh, some introductions first. Uh, for now, what I would like to do is introduce the panelists uh, today. And uh, those are uh, Peter Jezzer, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, uh, Dylan Roskam Zedris, uh, IP lawyer who's currently working with the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute at McGill, and Elizabeth Dupre, who's a PhD student uh, with uh, J.B. Pauline at uh, McGill University at the Neurological Institute. And myself, Nikola Stikov, I'm a professor uh, at the Ecole Polytechnique at the University of Montreal. So maybe uh, Peter, Elizabeth, Dylan, we can say a few words about ourselves before we start with the official part of the presentation. Uh, maybe we'll start with Peter. Uh, if you can just introduce yourself and uh, tell us a few words about how you came to be uh, MRM Editor-in-Chief. Sure, um, so, um, so I'm currently in Oxford. Um, MR physicist by background, um, I spent quite a few years at the NIH in the States before I came to Oxford. Um, and I was invited to be a deputy editor of MRM probably about 10 years ago now um, and served in that capacity for a number of years. And then when Matt was stepping down, I had my arm twisted to some extent, um, but there's no other journal that I would do this for. Um, ISMRM is definitely my extended family and MRM is my sort of logical um, home for my papers as well. So it's, it's a real honor to be serving as the editor-in-chief, which I've done for just about six, eight, eight months now. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, would you mind to say, would you mind saying a few words about yourself? Sure, absolutely. Um, so hi, I'm Elizabeth Dupree. I'm, as Nicolas said, a PhD student uh, working with Jean-Baptiste Pauline at, in Montreal. And I would say, so I, I am involved in, in some aspects of uh, to its traditionally MRM. So in particular, I've been involved in multi-echo functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but one thing uh, that really uh, has driven my work a lot is kind of the intersection between my field of interest primarily, which is computational neuroscience and, and neuroinformatics. So the impact that tools can have on the questions that we can ask and answer. Um, and there it's been really, really clear how important it is to think about the kind of tools we're creating. Are they reproducible? Are our findings reproducible? Are, is our code easy to access? Um, and so I, I've been uh, reasonably involved in the open source community to try and think about how we can better answer these questions in our own fields. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Dylan? Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. My name is Dylan Wade Roskams Idris. I'm the Open Science Alliance Officer for the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute at the Neuro. My role as Alliance Officer is really to reach out to folks across the global, but mainly Canadian neuroscience community to talk to them about open science and convince them to uptake open science. Small correction about what Nicola said, not officially IP lawyer, <laughs> law school graduate with significant experience studying intellectual property. So I don't have my IP lawyer hat on, um, but I'm very excited to come here and talk to you and try to reveal what I know and help the conversation in terms of talking about the future of replicability and reproducibility in neuroscience from the perspective of intellectual property. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, so I'm a faculty working on MRI uh, in Montreal. 
Uh, I've also been involved with quite a few science communication activities, including the Magnetic Resonance in Medicine Highlights that many of you are probably familiar with. Recently, uh, MRM Highlights took a turn towards promoting reproducible research, which uh, I thought was a very welcome development. And we also have Matthew Boudreau on the call, who is uh, currently running uh, the reproducibility uh, part of the Highlights Initiative. And uh, to me, uh, this panel is really just a nice opportunity to get somewhat different communities together talking about something that is very near and dear to us, and that is reproducibility. Reproducibility in science, and then reproducibility in MRI in general. Uh, the occasion for the panel is uh, an editorial that we wrote uh, pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, together with uh, Josh and Matt, and it was called Reproducibility and the Future of MRI Research. So what I will do is I will spend about five minutes introducing the editorial, not really sharing slides, just kind of talking about the main points. And uh, then what really motivated this panel is uh, when I tweeted about the editorial, Dylan had a very nice follow-up thread uh, on Twitter, which maybe somebody can actually share uh, while I'm talking. Uh, and then I said, Dylan, it would be nice if we did this in a more interactive format. So I reached out to Matt and Josh and Peter, and we agreed this would be an excellent opportunity to uh, get a conversation that's a little bit free form, broadcast live, but still, you know, not, um, uh, you know, and not, not in a way that really uh, binds us to talking points, more as a way to just get a conversation going. And eventually we will probably create an edited version of this conversation to upload on YouTube. Maybe I'll introduce Rachel as well. Rachel is the co-chair of the CONP Communications Committee. And we've been organizing these webinars regularly, pretty much every month. Uh, and we usually alternate with the moderation. So uh, Rachel, very good to have you here. Oh, it's exciting to be here. And it's nice to see so many faces, uh, familiar and new. Uh, I'm going to be pretty quiet on this one as I'm uh, in charge of making some notes. But uh, I'll chime in when I have an opinion, I'm sure. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, we, we broke a record with attendance this time. So it seems like you know, yeah, we're getting increasingly, increasingly popular. So uh, when I talk about reproducibility, I realize that many people have different ideas of what it is. And um, uh, it's really difficult to have this kind of common ground on which we can have a discussion about reproducibility, because some people will argue that the key to reproducibility is openness open software, open data. Others will say that it's transparency in the publishing process. Uh, and here I will go out on a limb and give my own perspective, which I think is also reflected in the editorial, uh, which is to promote reproducibility, a PDF is not enough. And this is not to say that, you know, the past 500 years of academic publishing, which have been pretty much based on the PDF and on paper, uh, are not reproducible, far from it. But things have changed in the 21st century. And especially when we talk about a field such as MRI that is very data, very software, very hardware intensive, it really makes sense that uh, there's many things that are omitted from the PDF. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's been this uh, big uh, disconnect between the way that publishers present research, which is still tied to paper or its electronic equivalent, the PDF, and the way that researchers do their work, which is using software, using many different kinds of MRI tools, and uh, uh, of course, sharing a lot of the data that goes uh, in the research. Uh, now, the field has functioned very well for the past, what, 50 years or so. And primarily it's because MRI is a field that's driven by IP. There's lots of patents in MRI. And uh, those have made huge contributions. And uh, this is an insight that uh, Matt had for the editorial, which is the very word patent implies openness. So I think there is a, a, a misunderstanding that if we're talking about patents, that's somehow precluding openness and reproducibility in research. Many people would argue otherwise. Uh, and then I looked up the etymology of the word patent and it's true, you know, it, it, uh, it comes from Latin to be open. And for the Macedonians in the audience, we know that patent also means a zipper but I never knew where that came from. <laughs> so uh, anyway, something I learned in writing the editorial. Uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, reproducibility is incompatible with uh, IP and patenting. And I think that's something that we will hear from uh, Dylan in particular, but also from, from Elizabeth and Peter. What I will say is that for me, reproducibility is about adding value to the PDF, adding all of these different aspects of uh, transparency in research that are currently not very compatible with the paper, with the published paper. Uh, in a way, paper is an inefficient way to pass ideas in the 21st century. One, there's too much of it. 
that's something that we call research debt. Uh, there's a beautiful article by uh, 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 Ola and, and Carter uh, for the Distill publication arguing that we produce too many papers and then you know, we really cannot keep up. The style, the writing in the papers is becoming more and more difficult. People use jargon, the field is getting more specialized. So it's been becoming progressively more difficult to understand what we're writing about. And then finally, magically, faculty claim to be reading twice as many papers today than they, they were reading in the 1970s. So something's got to give. And my impression is that really what's happening is scientists don't really read the entire PDFs. They probably skim the abstract, look at the figures, try to make sense of it. But in the process, lots of things are missing. And in particular, uh, there are aspects of the uh, publishing process, such as the data and the software and the peer review process that would improve the whole publication process and hopefully uh, improve the reproducibility of papers. That being said, I think MRI is on pretty solid ground uh, because uh, the community is pretty small. People do know each other. They do work together. And uh, my experience with the journal MRM has been uh, 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 you know, pretty positive in the sense of getting a lot of uh, uh, constructive feedback from colleagues and uh, uh, making sure that what we produce is uh, well vetted. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there hasn't been much of a push to uh, complement PDFs with supplementary materials. So uh, we have mentioned in the editorial a couple of alternatives, one being open data sets that can be hosted on various platforms, including hopefully very soon our own MR Hub platform that we're working on at the moment. Uh, publishing software papers uh, that uh, don't follow the necessary structure of hypotheses, methods, conclusions, but still uh, drive the field forward. And we can say that in MRM, there has been quite a few luminaries that developed open source tools, probably in the late 90s, early 2000s, that are really now the, the hallmarks of uh, reconstruction in MRI. Uh, for example, there is the non-uniform Fourier transform tool. There is also the compressed sensing toolbox that uh, Mickey Lustig published. And these papers are one of the most cited papers in MRM. Uh, so definitely there is this incentive to uh, not only share the paper, but also supplementary information. But on the other hand, we're faced with this incentive structure where uh, unless it's a properly vetted peer reviewed article in a journal, it's really difficult to get credit for all of the different uh, contributions. We're trying to change that, but we realize that MRM is an international journal there is no one size fits all approach. And uh, that is why mandates are really not the right way to promote reproducibility. For many people, certain things are gonna be easy and others will be hard. Some people are comfortable with sharing software, not data. So uh, uh, in, a, in a journal like MRM, what's really important is to make it possible for people to share those aspects that they're comfortable with and then hope that that pushes the field forward. So in my head, a PDF is not enough. Uh, the open science community is large and there's lots of battles that it's fighting, but I feel that the battle for reproducible research is the one that it cannot afford to lose. So today we're here to discuss different aspects of reproducibility, what it means for the field of MRI, and maybe we'll go to a broader discussion of what it means for neuroscience and maybe science in general. So to not take uh, more time, uh, what I would like to do now is uh, ask Dylan to follow up with his response to the editorial. So Dylan, feel free to share the thread or maybe just uh, retell it in your own words today. Then we'll go with Elizabeth, who's gonna have a more software developer perspective. And finally, we'll hear from Peter about how MRM is addressing all of these issues that we're raising uh, today. Okay, perfect. Hello everybody once again. Um, thank you, Nicola. So I was scrolling through Twitter and I generally click on the links that Nicola posts because usually they're high quality or at least hilarious. Um, and I just, I read through his editorial and almost all of it, all of it really was on point in terms of things needing to emerge from the community and reproducibility being fundamentally important. The one part that I read and thought, hmm, I'm not sure whether I 100% agree with that was the discussion of intellectual property. This is something that I have looked at and studied a fair amount in the past. In during my law school, I got a specialty in health law and policy, specifically looking at the interaction between intellectual property and the tools developed and used in neuroscience. So this is something that I think about a fair amount. I offered to respond with a bit of a thread if Nicola was interested, to which he enthusiastically said yes. So to start things off, 
I've got two kind of hats that I'm wearing today, and I'll try to differentiate them bet between them as much as possible. One is my Open Science Alliance Officer Open Science hat, which is all about reducing the barriers to people sharing and as well as people being able to reuse scientific resources. And one is the person who has read a lot about reproducibility and intellectual property and simply wants to act as a facilitator and advice giver and a place where you can leverage any expertise that I can bring. So the first thing I want to address is what Nicola just said about patents and reproducibility. And what he said is 100% correct. There's no fundamental issue between patents and reproducibility. If by reproducibility, what we mean is the ability to take the results in a paper and reproduce them from the experimental protocol. So using the appropriate methods on the data to be able to reproduce the results and confirm the claims. That's absolutely the case. The reason I'm so concerned with this is that I'm fascinated by the evolution of science, specifically neuroscience, within the 21st century, which is so fundamentally based on computational systems, software, and the sharing of information across the internet. One of the problems here is what Nicola addressed, that PDFs are simply not enough. You need data, you need software, you need accurate descriptions of methods and protocols to be able to appropriately reproduce. So where patents come into this, and where intellectual property generally comes into this, is it is often quite slow. So the opportunity for people to be able to collaboratively develop, connect from across the world on new protocols, new methods, new pieces of software is slowed down if it takes two years or significantly longer to obtain a patent over a method of using an MRI machine in order to you know, obtain a certain result or a method of taking data and turning it into a particular result. So that's, uh, the problem isn't a fundamental tension between patents and reproducibility. The problem is the pace at which things are advancing nowadays and a fundamental tension between the length of time it takes to get something like a patent and the need to be able to rapidly and iteratively advance the protocols you're using, the software you're using for data for acquisition as well as for analysis of data. So the reason I responded uh, is because I think a lot about all of these things and I wanted to engage in a bit of a discussion. Let's see, let me just quickly check out my notes. So as a quick little backgrounder, there are a couple of different bits of IP that are relevant here in the software space. One is the patents, which we've just been discussing. Another is copyright, which is where open source generally directs its uh, attempts to combat the problems with intellectual property. I can answer more details about copyright if you'd like, but uh, ask me if you would. And the other is trade secrets, where you keep a piece of software or a method secret in order to protect it from others being able to use it. All of these present problems for the rapid and iterative development of techniques within science. So if you have copyright and someone else can't use your code or adapt your code for their own purposes, mm, that presents some problems. If you have a trade secret protected by confidentiality clauses and DRM, then no one has access to the code that you're using in order to produce a result and therefore there's a problem for reproducibility. So there are a number of problems when it comes to the interaction between IP and reproducibility. Let me make sure I don't take too much of your time here. So we've talked about the speed of advances. Let's just go through some of the tweets. So the first set of responses that I made was it's important for the scientific community, for any scientific community, but for the MR scientific community, to think hard about the relationship between intellectual property and the tools that it uses, because there are uh, these tensions that I just discussed. So one of the problems is you need to think hard about the relationship between proprietary models and the public uh, and open models. And if you don't think hard about what the kind of productive tension between those two models should be and how it should look, you run the risk of getting locked into private and proprietary models. This might not be a problem because if everybody uses the same set of proprietary software, you're actually gonna have fantastic reproducibility. However, um, 
in a world where things are iterating and moving so quickly, being locked into models or being locked into a particular piece of software or a particular set of methods might not be the way to advance science as best as possible, uh, the best way it possibly can. Another issue that you need to think about is who should be establishing the standard. So who should be establishing what is the standard software that you use? Should it be the scientific community itself working together and iteratively developing the tools that it uses? Or should it be um, an external private entity that comes in and tells you, you know, this is the best software that you should be using? Once again, that's not something that I have an answer to, but it's something that you have to think critically about in order to make sure that the future of your field is as healthy and robust and rapid and iterative as it possibly can be. Another thing to be interested in and something to consider is intellectual property does put a barrier on who can contribute. Um, proprietary models and proprietary software can often be quite expensive to run or expensive to get a license for, which limits the number of people who can actually contribute. I already addressed this other point, but patents are extremely slow, especially software patents. They can take years and years to grant. And if you disclose your invention before you've applied, before you've, uh, before you've applied, um, you will not get your patent. You fail at the novelty criteria which means that there is inherently some secrecy, at least at the beginning, when it comes to obtaining a patent, which means that if you're just developing something, you have to be extremely careful about who you share it with and the restrictions you put on who they're allowed to share things with. All right, I'm almost done. Because of this slowness, uh, a lot of companies do resort to the trade secret method. So putting confidentiality clauses in terms of uses, in terms of use and using DRM to restrict how you can interact with code in a field that's developing as rapidly as magnetic, re magnetic resonance, you need to be thinking about whether that speed and modifiability and collaborative nature early on is something that you want to foster. If it is, then you have to think hard about the role you want intellectual property to play. Open source development gets around all, a lot of these problems. And the last thing that I want to say is that the considerations around IP aren't just restricted to software. Um, there are exciting movements in the open hardware space that I would encourage you to pay attention to. Check out OpenTrons, OpenEFIS, and OpenBCI. This is probably not going to be quite as relevant for magnetic resonance until we have room temperature um, superconductors, which might take a little while, but might happen soon. But if we do have those, then the possibility of having an open hardware approach to the development of just MRI machines themselves is something that I am looking very much forward to. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. And uh, there are actually quite a few uh, open hardware developments that I'm happy to tell you about. But uh, yeah, it's exciting that you know the whole machine is really opening up to us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next we'll go with Elizabeth, uh, and she will give us a software developer perspective on the issue. Sure. Yeah. So, so I, I should say it's both software developer, but also I think uh, maybe just uh, an early career researcher Not in too, that. <laughs> no, but I think a lot of the research involves like developing these tools. So, so maybe the angle I'll take on this is that I very much agree with basically everything Dylan said. Um, and so the, the piece where I think it's sort of missing from the, the current editorial, and I think Dylan's point speaks to this a little bit, is the idea that we can think about reproducibility as Nicola, as you mentioned, in different ways. So you could think about reproducibility along different dimensions, but perhaps one way that uh, I've seen kind of conceptualized is that you could think about reproducibility as same code, same data, or different code, different data, and the little uh, four by four square that you get there, right? So if you have code and data that you, let's say you release both, then you know right away that you can reproduce those results because you have access to the underlying pieces. But if you want to extend it such that you can say, okay, can I write my own code to get your results on this data set? What becomes really important is one, uh, that the code is, is like licensed in a way, as much as the IP is saying, licensed in a way such that people can interact with that code in some way. And two, um, that it's understandable. And so I think to those two dimensions are actually somewhat distinct. 
Um, because what I mean when I say understandable is that it's not just reusable uh, to people within your own research group. So it's, it's very possible for people to release code or data that meets standards that they've developed in their own research group and is perfectly reproducible in that context. But if another researcher wants to come and build on it, it's less clear how they would go about doing so. Uh, for example, if you have a very particular file naming convention, or if you have code that relies on some, you know, internal libraries where that's not released, but the code itself is released. Um, these sorts of things can slow things down in terms of allowing researchers to come and to reproduce your results and, and to build on them, which is what Nicola said is, is kind of the goal of uh, this, these efforts to make things beyond the PDF available. And so if we think about how can we make code that's understandable such that you, know, you could generalize results to different contexts, different scanners, perhaps, um, one thing that becomes important is um, how is it developed? Is it developed in a way where it's, it's being seen by different eyes, by different sets of people working in different contexts? And this is where open source is really, really powerful. So I, I want to clear up, I think there's some misconception around open source because there's disagreement within the field itself about what it means. So a lot of times when people think about open source, they think about what's known as free software. Um, this is what was really promoted by the uh, new foundation by Richard Stallman. And the idea there is that whatever software you produce, if it's licensed with what's called a copyleft license, then it has to remain freely available. It can never be commercialized. And a lot of folks, uh, I think rightly, are, are sort of concerned about that. That's not what they're interested in producing or they have you know, res uh, restrictions that would prevent them from engaging in that. And so a lot of people have stayed away from free, from open source, I think around a lot of concerns around free software, but open source isn't actually synonymous with free software. There are, there are some people who would argue that it is, but I would say at this point, the majority of the community, particularly um, the younger community, I would say is, is really pushing for open source as a separate model. And so here the idea is not so much that the software cannot be commercialized. That's something that's uh, perfectly fine. There are some restrictions in terms of like, you wanna make sure that if it's commercialized, you know that it's still freely available and, and that people can access the source code even if you're running things with it. But really the focus has shifted in the community from how the software is licensed or how it's distributed to how it's produced. Um, so the idea then is that we're really focusing on what does it look like when we're creating software? What is the process through which either, um, and really the focus is software, but you, know, you could extend this to data, of course. So what does it look like when we're engaging in this? Who's able to participate? How are they able to participate? And is it done in a way where it's understandable um, to an outsider who comes onto the project later? Would they be able to pick up and see what's going on? And when we move from that model to, or from a production model to a distribution model, I think we see a lot of the benefits um, that you're talking about, Nicola, in terms of making sure that people can take the pieces and, and go and build what they need with them. Thanks, Elizabeth. So uh, uh, before I pass it on to Peter, uh, there is a comment from another Peter, Peter Bandettini, and uh, he raises the issue of pulse sequence development. Because for MRI, that's you know a really important topic that you know we bunch into software, but it's definitely very different in the sense that vendors have uh, uh, control over the languages in which this pulse sequence development is done. So maybe Peter, as you're following up on this discussion, if you want to touch on the issue that Peter is bringing up, please feel free. Uh, as an MR physicist, you are in the best position to comment on it, and then we will open it up for other people on this uh, call to uh, ask questions and discuss. So Peter. Okay, thanks, Nicola, and thanks for organising this. Um, so, in fact, it's interesting that um, Peter Bandettini would uh, would make that point because I was I was going to bring that up to some extent and maybe sort of cast it out as a question to this panel for creative ideas as to how we address the issue of proprietary software that you know we are not allowed to make easily available to um, others, but you know nevertheless you want to make sure that if you are publishing a new pulse sequence that others can reproduce it and um, implement it on their system. So th that it's, it's an important issue that I think is worthy of discussion. 
Um, I am not going to say a great deal because I don't feel that compared to most of the people on this call, I am any great expert in this area. And I'm partly here to, to learn as much as anything. Um, but I can just tell you about one or two things that we are trying to do, inspired in part by that editorial, but also um, by a strong sense myself that we should be um, aiming to make sure that um, insofar as is possible, we can pass on the, um, the knowledge and the know-how that we publish in our papers, because I, I absolutely agree with this um, idea that, you know, the paper or the PDF is not enough, that you really do need more information. And <clears throat> from anybody who's really tried to study a paper closely and, and reproduce it um, in, in their own lab, there's often some stumbling block that you come across. You don't quite know how somebody's implemented something. Um, and you really would like to know that. And if that can be made available um, through supplementary material and repositories and so on, um, then that would be great in, in my opinion. So um, one of the thing, first things that I did this year um, was I introduced um, the um, facility of a data availability statement, um, spent a little bit of time trying to work out what it should be called and the industry standard does appear to be data availability, stand, uh, data availability statement, despite the fact that it covers code as well as data. Um, but what we are trying to do now is encourage um, as much as possible our authors to include a data availability statement in which they can describe where code and data that underlie this, the publication can be found. Um, and I'm pleased to say that there has been a, a good uptake um, in this already. We've also asked re reviewers to highlight during the review process if they um, identify examples of good reproducible research and to encourage it to some extent in their reviews. Um, as Nicola said, um, in a field like MRI, I think it would be very challenging to mandate that people provide code and data for all sorts of reasons, privacy, proprietary licenses that they themselves will have signed and so on. But where it's possible, I think it should be encouraged and it should be encouraged strongly. And so that's one thing that we're trying to do. And I'm delighted to see that more and more of these data availability statements are coming up in, in papers now. Um, and then another couple of things that we're aiming to do. Um, one area is post-publication um, author reviewer dialogue. We haven't kicked this off yet. Um, but I included it as a uh, question in, in a recent readership survey. And there was strong support for us to do this, to uh, establish some mechanism for, you know, effectively posting a question to the authors and, and getting a response. Um, again, it's very typical that, you know, there'll be some little detail that just wasn't thought of, what's missed out in the, uh, in the original paper, but it's actually quite crucial to being able to implement something. And so an, an ability to go back, post a question publicly, get an answer, that's visible to anybody else to see. I think that would be very valuable. So that's one thing that, um, that I'm gonna be talking to Matthew about um, with regard to MRM highlights, because I think that could be a vehicle for doing that. Um, another thing that I, I did um, inquire about in the readership survey, and might be interesting to get people's opinions on this as well, is the idea of um, transparent reviewing and making more availability of the uh, of the author reviewer dialogue that goes on during the uh, review process. Um, and transparent reviewing can mean various things and it can mean that the uh, reviewers should be uh, unveiled at the end or even um, you know, during the process. I don't necessarily feel that that is an important element of it, but what, what I have noticed um, both as an author and as a reviewer and now as an editor is that there's often a huge amount of really useful back and forth that goes on between the reviewer and the author, um, which once that paper is accepted is kind of gone and is lost to you know, the scientific community. Um, and again, I don't think that I would um, feel that we should mandate it, but I think that it, 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 it should be encouraged. Um, there are some tricky issues around just making sure that by um, adding it as an option, we don't bias the process in some way that was unintended. So I'm thinking carefully about how we might do this. Um, and the response to the question was a little bit mixed. Um, I wouldn't say that there was overwhelming support for it, but there was enough support that we should look into it, but also um, enough resistance that we would not mandate it. And I think we need to make it as available as an option. Um, but as I say, something we just need to think through um, the logistics of how we offer it so that it doesn't in some way bias the process. 
Um, I think probably those are the main things that I wanted to mention. Um, clearly, the focus today is software, but I think that there's a lot more than software that is published in MRM, um, or at least um, you know, uh, papers that rely on software. And it would be good to think about how we can get reproducibility in, in all of the areas that we, we publish in, in MRM. Uh, but I will turn back now to Nicola. Thank you very much, Peter. So uh, this wraps up kind of the, the expose part of the panel. Uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, Matt, Josh, uh, if they have anything to add to this discussion, in particular with the way that I represented the editorial, and I'm sure there's certain aspects that I uh, might have missed. Uh, so, uh, uh, Matt, I see you. No, uh, yeah, I think that was that was a very good summary, and the discussion's very good. I just make a general comment that I think when you're trying to drive a sustainable change, there's really two main aspects, and one is the infrastructure, like the repositories, you know, the GitHubs, the, then the funding, you know, then the funding agencies and an NIH, you know, both as a grant writer and reviewer, we're seeing more emphasis on reproducible research. And then also academic promotion committees. Those are all part of the infrastructure, but really a, a really big part of it is the cultural part. And I think that the cult, just seeing the great turnout on, on this meeting, it's really gaining momentum and I've seen, you know, when I was editor, I saw many borderline papers would hinge, the review process would hinge on whether or not, you know, they included the source code and it's really becoming a cultural issue. And if you reach that, that cultural uh, acceptance, then you, and you reach a tipping point, then I don't think you'll have to mandate it. It'll just become something that we do. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Josh, anything to add? Yeah. Uh, just kind of two points. Um, one of them, just in general, thing to keep in mind that we have the perspective not only from dealing on the recon side, which is a lot closer to hardware and vendor applications, uh, but also for Matt and I, who are primary workplaces here in a hospital as opposed to a traditional university, uh, is looking at uh, translation and add translation into practice. And this can be both into clinical practice here at our institution or trying to get things towards industry. And very often, a lot of the reproducible research that comes out now, uh, people make things like Jupyter Notebook pages and whatnot, which are great for teaching, but they have almost no practical value in terms of translating that into something which is a turnkey uh, piece of code, which can be handed in over and used routinely in practice. Uh, there are groups who have a very good mind for this, uh, like the Bark Group and whatnot, who have a lot of high performance code under the hood. But it's something just to keep in mind is that also to make things really reproducible, not just in terms of teaching and academics, but also reproducible out in the wild. Uh, we gotta make sure that there's that performance aspect that's always kept in mind. Um, also, one of the things, Paul Weavers, who used to be with us here at Mayo, uh, hopped to GE and is now at Scope, um, also brought up a good point here on the chat, is uh, in the discussion with industry, um, you know, there's tons of motivation for all of the research side reaching out and trying to say, how could we make, say, pulse sequences that work across platforms and whatnot? Uh, there's the other perspective, though, is from the industry side of how can we, how can we make this appealing to them? Um, trying to you know, ask somebody like GE to completely overhaul their pulse sequence environment, they don't have the resources to do that. It would be completely impossible for them to do that. And so it's how can we look at the perspective of really working in a partnership with the different vendors and making it so that there, there is something in it for them as well? Uh, translating research concepts, really making it easier to get it out to them as well. So that's something I definitely say, keep in mind. Thank you very much, Josh. So I, I agree that, uh, you know, the, the transparency goes you know, all the way down. And uh, before we have started the official part, we were talking about workflows in general, because what you need is you need kind of this uh, multi-layered pipeline where you start at the scanner with a pulse sequence, you get the raw data, you reconstruct it, then you do some standardization of the format, then you do some post-processing. And a lot of those things are hidden behind black boxes, or if they're not, at least they don't work together really well. But recently, there have been efforts to make more vendor-neutral sequences. And we've seen a couple of papers, even some papers included in highlights that try to attempt, uh, that attempt to do this. Uh, we have seen containers as a way to connect different kinds of uh, pieces so that you can run the exact same code in the exactly same uh, environment. And uh, uh, I think that even down to the pulse sequence, as long as we have a common language, which is currently missing because the vendors have different kinds of uh, uh, environments, uh, we could actually achieve reproducibility 
And of course, some of it is going to be turnkey and really easy and really fast. But other things don't need to be that because there is a whole step of kind of post-processing afterwards that, you know, you can do at your own time. So I agree with you. Some things need to be really fast and need to, you know, execute right there in the clinic. Others, most of the post-processing routines, including a lot of fMRI stuff or a lot of quantitative MRI, those don't need the speed as much as they need the code that's kind of there for other people to, to uh, load and, and execute. So uh, we've had a couple of questions in the uh, chat. So I would say, you know, we can start with a few there. Paul, uh, uh, Josh already addressed what you uh, discussed, but if you want to turn on your microphone and comment, please uh, go ahead. And otherwise, please post questions for the audience. Probably we won't have time for everybody to answer everything, but also we're different expertises anyway. So in the chat window, if you can just address a question to somebody in the panel and uh, they will uh, do their best to respond. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nicola. Um, just the, the comment about um, vendor, uh, you know, se supporting sequences across different vendors, um, putting on my scope hat, this is something we do very often. And um, I'd say it's, it's the bulk of our support burden is um, helping our customers understand which changes they need to make, how to do them in a good way, um, and how to make sure that um, our communication with them is also in line with their research agreements with, with each vendor. Um, and then how they can share their solutions among their user community. So this, this isn't going to change. The, the vendors aren't going to freely release all of their sequence code. There's, there's too, much, too much behind that. But um, you know, there's, I, I mentioned some, some initiatives that are trying to, to step out and then have an interposer layer where there's this kind of fake vendor sequence and then you can do your sequence programming in MATLAB, for example. Um, so these are some nice, nice ways to try and do that. Um, they don't address translation to the clinic. There's too much, too many regulatory and safety things that need to be checked um, in real time. Um, but at least for um, getting proof of concept and getting things which are out there and reproducible by many groups, um, that's that's one thing which would be um, great to be widely adopted. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Julian had a comment in the chat. Uh, Julian, care to uh, expand uh, by turning on your mic, or would you like me to ask it? I could expand if it's not clear enough, but I think it's a uh, fairly self-explanatory message. Uh, problem of curation. So uh, it's something that we're really dealing with uh, currently with the Reproducible Research Study Group. And uh, it's true that you know, it's really easy to put code out there, but how it gets organized, that's a problem. And if the whole community is gonna get rallied behind it, uh, we need a proper publication venue. So uh, the Journal of Open Source Software, that's JOS, it already does it. It's free, it does everything on GitHub, the reviews are transparent, and at least everything is there in a very organized, curated way. There's provenance, and there's version control, and all of these things that journals don't really do at the moment. So a uh, question from the editor-in-chief or past editor-in-chiefs on this call, uh, uh, Peter may be starting first. Um, well, I'm acutely aware of it as, as an issue, and I think that um, we need to offer good guidance to our authors if we're going to encourage them to be doing this. Um, I don't know if Martin Weck is, is, on, the, uh, is on the call, um, but he has been helping to at least think about this and to try and propose some solutions that we can offer to our authors. Um, I don't have it available um, right now, but I can assure you that it's being, it's being investigated and I certainly recognize that we need a decent solution. Yeah, so I'm not sure if uh, Martin is on the call. Uh, I know that Florian is there, and we've discussed this at the Reproducible Research Study Group, and you know, the Publication Committee of MRM is also aware of this. Uh, there were a couple of questions that were sent in the registration form, and one of them had to do about you know, MRM endorsing or supporting data publications, and uh, you know, how uh, broad is the definition of what MRM will publish. Is this something that uh, uh, you've considered uh, or maybe discussed in the past? Um, I, I'm going to confess that it had not really hit my radar. I don't know, Matt, if, if you'd thought about it in the past. Um, I mean, I've only thought about it briefly, um, but it's not immediately obvious to me that MRM is the sort of journal that is likely to be a good vehicle for that kind of publication, just given the sort of technical nature of what we tend to publish. Um, whereas I would assume that this has more of a role in maybe large scale imaging studies themselves. Um, 
I wouldn't say that I'd rule it out, but I think we'd have to think very carefully about it. I'd want to take it through the editorial board. Um, and it may have some consequences that some of our readers might not be so happy with. Um, I suspect that it probably would damage the impact factor a bit if we did a lot of it. Um, and I initially, my initial um, feeling is that I hope we can do this via the sorts of um, data availability statement and supplementary material uh, facilities that we're offering. But um, Matt, did you ever think about that sort of thing? No, I don't have anything much to add, although there are also, you know, other constraints to consider beyond the ones that you talked about, like HIPAA, for example, in the US, the, the patient privacy laws. So a lot to work around. Uh, there's a comment from uh, Eric, uh, and sorry, you know, I'm, I'm reading and, and trying to speak. Uh, so Eric, if you want to uh, ask it, please do. Otherwise, I'll try to uh, interpret. So thanks. I think it's a... Uh... If building on some of the discussion we had so far um, uh, on uh, journal options, I guess, for supporting, I guess, the culture that's growing about, about uh, translation and reproducibility, should there be a, an article type that is dedicated to um, a reproduction study or, or, or a study that is, let's say, similar in design, even though the, the data um, and, the, and the methods may be entirely of the, of, of the, the new group and not, not of the original? Because in some cases, the review culture might, might have less enthusiasm uh, for a reproduction study, uh, even though we all recognize the, their importance, right? So we all, we all have both innovation hats and translational hats, I guess. And the question is whether the journal, there should be a lane for, I don't know, a, a paper that's devoted to that. So it's clear it's not meant to be the same um, contribution as a new original research. So we'll, I will ask Elizabeth here, both as an early career researcher and also as somebody that, you know, works on quite a few initiatives that are not considered, you know, conventional mm, hypothesis driven research articles. Uh, Elizabeth, care to uh, comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't comment necessarily on what, what that would look like for MRM. Um, but in terms of, of more generally, I think that, yeah, there, there are growing incentives to recognize the work that goes into making this feasible. Um, so increasingly I've seen there are some researchers like uh, Russ Poldrack or Lucy Nodine are, are good examples I can think of who have dedicated sections on their CVs or have talked about how on hiring committees like these sort of initiatives um, are becoming more and more important. Like have you uh, done something that you know shares code or shares data um, that's not to say it's necessarily an article type, but that the work that goes into doing this is, is recognized in a, in a broader context. Um, but that, that is changing slowly. I would say that even in the past five years, it seems to have advanced pretty significantly, at least from where I've been sitting. Um, and I would expect in the next five years, there are more and more incentives for that as well. Because right now, I think the field is still coming to grips with how hard it is to reproduce a lot of these results. And, and as that becomes available, the invisible, traditionally invisible work of making them reproducible will become more valued. As to whether or not that would be a distinct article type, I'm not sure, but there are definitely more and more venues coming out to support the different pieces of this. Like Joss has already been mentioned, scientific data is a specific, um, uh, our journal for sharing data papers. Um, so there are more and more of these becoming available. And uh, Georg had a comment. So Dylan, please go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to add quickly, coming from a somewhat external view right here, I just wanna highlight how exciting it is to see the folks on this call, which represent a couple of different levels, right? Because re restructuring incentives towards producing research that's reproducible or making sure that research that's reported is reproducible needs to take place on a couple of different levels. It needs to take place on the level of the individual researcher who just decides to do it. It needs to take place on the part of the academic community, which we have here. It needs to take place on the part of journals, which we also have here. And it needs to take place on the part of funders, at the very least. Just the Tri-Council in Canada have signed DORA. If you haven't seen DORA, please look it up. But they have not as of yet implemented it. So if as journals and a community, you can work together to demand that they actually implement it and do so towards reproducibility, you have some leverage to be able to do so. 
this is a participatory creation of how the future of your field is going to work. And one of the things that I'm so fascinated with uh, and why I'm so pleased to have been invited to sit on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, so Georg had a comment about uh, replication studies. Uh, we have a couple of challenges that uh, happen. The first one was about uh, sense. The second one was about T1 mapping. We haven't had anything on MRS yet, but it seems like you would like to have something. Uh, care to expand? Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Um, yeah, I've, I've been following your efforts to, to, to do that. And I think, well, well yeah, M MRS suffers from, from a lot of problems, in, um, including the fact that, that its most popular analysis tool is a, is a commercial black box toolbox. So that has kind of, it's both a blessing and a curse for the field that it was that it, it yielded good results for 20 years, but nobody really understood how it worked. So um, I, I guess what I'm what I was what I was aiming at with my question was was similar to what Eric um, came up with. Is um, yeah, is is there are there are there any plans at MRM to kind of open up an article category like this that is solely dedicate it to taking another one's uh, methods and seeing whether they actually reproduce the results because MRS in particular just needs to needs to go down that route of really scrutinizing even their most basic analysis techniques otherwise we I feel we're getting stuck somewhere in the in the late 1990s methodologically and um MRS in particular could just could just benefit from from a nudge and as a field from more encouragement to to scrutinize the methods in in down to the to to a very low level of detail. Um, yeah, well, I mean, in terms of a particular article type, I had not thought about that. I mean, I'm I'm all ears, and I will go away and think about this, and uh, we may well want to do something like that. I don't think that necessarily the current framework precludes it. Um, I mean, as you say, there's maybe an issue about the receptiveness of, uh, of the receptiveness of reviewers. Um, but having said that, we have deputy editors who um, interpret those reviews, and you know they they can have some sway as well. Um, and on this call, we have I mean, at least I can see two of my deputy editors staring me in the face. So th there's clearly an interest in this kind of area. In fact, one of whom, Florian, might wish to say something about a, reproduce, a reproduce, reproducibility paper that um, he's currently moving through the system if he feels um, that he's willing to do that. Um, but I, I, I mean, we certainly um, would, I mean, I would encourage appropriate reproducibility studies. If the MRS community wanted to get together a little bit and um, submit something, then I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, I, I mean, there, there are some... Um, attempts at least to um, open up the the black box that you refer to and I'm a co-author on one paper that has tried to do that and in fact um, in my own lab here I know of another paper that's going through review at the moment which is trying to do the same sort of thing it would be fantastic if that could become an actual reproducibility study at some point amongst you know a, a group of experts who could test these things and kick their tires a bit um, does it need its own um, paper category well if if they're being rejected on the basis that you know that our reviewers are, uh, are, are not willing to consider them then yeah we should probably consider that I'm I would hope that we can do it within the framework we've got, got already but please let me know if you think that isn't possible thank you Peter so Florian care to say a few words about the reproducibility challenges sure yeah um Thanks for bringing it up, uh, Gita and Nicola. So we have been uh, running um, two reproducibility challenges um, in the reproducible research study group. The last one was on, we took a seminal paper from MRM and asked our community to re-implement it. We provided data and then asked them to submit their results. And that is this paper that um, Peter was talking about and now ongoing, uh, Nicola is running a, a second challenge on T1 mapping. I can say a couple of words about the first paper and it was really interesting since somebody mentioned this point of having a paper category for reproducibility. We were really surprised when we were analyzing the results and then putting the paper together at what low level you could actually go down and really see quite substantial differences in the individual um, approaches that our participants uh, submitted. 
And then how much work it actually took. So one of the efforts that we did in this paper was we wanted to come up with consolidated implementations of the, like all the submissions that we got to harmonize them, to make sure that even though all of the people who submitted work together really come up with one consensus implementation, it was quite interesting to see um, why we put this together, um, yeah, where the differences really are. And I have to say, it clearly goes, uh, like Nicola, you said, the PDF is not enough. It goes way beyond the steps of what you would write down explicitly in the paper. So that, that was really interesting to see. So the paper is under review. It's um, hopefully uh, coming out soon. We are working on the revision and um, I can send it out or via the study group to everybody who is interested. And Nicola, one, uh, one, one comment on the paper type, uh, maybe one related precedent that we do have at the journal is when I was editor, I very much supported the idea of, an, of publishing papers on negative results. I found them to be very, in, you know, very uh, useful for the field to prevent a lot of unnecessary work. And a lot of times I was, re, you know, reproducing a, pre, a previous positive result. And um, I write, really tried to encourage, and I didn't get a lot of them, but I thought the ones that we got were useful. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So uh, we did have a comment from uh, John Frederick, uh, and uh, we actually conducted an uh, interview with him. Uh, I think Aga Karakuzu did this interview, uh, talking about pulse and how we can uh, make vendor neutral sequences. So John Frederick, if you would like to expand on that, uh, please go ahead. Uh, and everybody can take a look at uh, the work that uh, he's doing with Steven and uh, Jeff Fessler. Yeah, th thank you, I'm glad this came up. So, so I'm part of the pulse team, so we developed uh, that platform initially as a, really as a tool for us as researchers, just as a way to, to rapidly prototype sequences. Um, and so in the process, we realized that we could do this across platforms. And so that's where the collaboration came in. So in that recent interview, we just use it on, on our GE scanners, but then we can, we can uh, you know, change the formats between scanners and uh, execute that on, on sequences as well. And so there are kind of two pieces to this. So that my comment uh, was to, you know, we, we could encourage authors to basically um, to generate a pulse file. And the, the MATLAB pulse library is pretty easy to use. Uh, and even if they don't intend to actually use that pulse file to execute a sequence, you can at least have a fully specified sequence that you can share with others. And that's down to you know, down to the most minute timing details, basically. So all the gradient RF waveforms and phases. And so it's just a thought. So uh, I don't, again, I don't think we want to require, require this, but I think we have at least shown that with this setup, uh, this is a proof of principle, this can be done. And at, at least the sequence can be specified in a, in a way that can be shared and accessed via the Pulse uh, toolbox. So that's, perhaps that's one step sort of, uh, toward uh, making the pulse sequences more, more shareable. Uh, the separate question is, you know, will the vendors uh, get on board with this and fully support it? Uh, maybe not, I mean, perhaps we don't have to wait for that. We can at least uh, share the sequence uh, in, a, in an open way and that hopefully makes it more reproducible. Thank you. So uh, this is kind of the one hour mark at which, you know, I said, you know, we will be wrapping up uh, people are free to stick around, but uh, no pressure. I think what I really enjoyed about this is that it's such a broad topic and there's so many different angles that it's really difficult to find a common language. And uh, uh, I think it's important for uh, the MR physicists to be talking more to the open software, uh, uh, open data communities, because there is a disconnect about what they think is important for transparency and openness. Uh, and uh, having these kinds of conversations hopefully levels the field. Uh, I know that uh, many of you will need to go, but uh, I would be happy to stick around for a little bit. And uh, if uh, the panelists are still available, it would be nice to hear your finishing thoughts on what you think is important for the field moving forward and how we can reconcile these different kinds of discussion that happen at many different uh, levels, starting from IPs all the way to the uh, uh, nitty gritty of the uh, pulse sequence development and uh, what would be you know, the, right, uh, the right path forward 
short term and long term. So I'll go in the same order that we uh, uh, started. So I will ask Dylan to uh, give us a wrap up first. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you. I learned a heck of a lot. And so I'm going to be saving some of those comments in the chat. I guess my final thought for all of you would be the future of your field and the future of your relationship with vendors is going to be dependent on your individual and collective action and what you demand of each other and of your field. If you recognize that what's going on right now in science in the 21st century is a movement away from things like papers and the movement towards making almost an information environment, including data, software, these pulse sequences that you were talking about, the rate at which things are going to advance is only going to continue to speed up. And the only way to ensure that that goes as quickly and as smoothly as possible and as transparently as possible is to encourage open practices in, because they do enhance reproducibility and replicability. This needs to be happen, this needs to happen at all levels. And ultimately it should happen from the community that uses those tools themselves. I don't think that there's a fundamental conflict between vendors and users, for example, but I would love to see the encouragement of the appropriate use of open source and transparent tools by vendors, whether they commercialize it through in software as a service or infrastructure as a service or customization services, uh, commercialization model, I would love to see it advance in that direction because the current intellectual property instruments that exist emerge during the industrial revolution and were for things like planes and trains and automobiles, not for things that can be rapidly iterated in an online environment. So this is an exciting time and it's an exciting environment for you to interact with and for you to build. And so I would encourage you to be active in building it and not wait for it to be built for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Elizabeth? I, I would absolutely second everything Dylan said. Um, I think one critical piece of this idea of building it with other people is that when you go partially related to the points that have come up already around like curation and about uh, the kinds of information necessary that aren't contained in a PDF. When you go and you, you're working with other people, it quickly becomes obvious kind of what, what pieces of information are missing, and then you have to develop a common language to describe those. So one thing that I found really remarkable um, in the open source community in general is the extent from to which different fields are learning from each other. So there are a lot of advances in things like astronomy, um, in tooling that end up driving changes in neuroscience because the, the, the workflow and the, the platforms are built in a way where they can be easily repurposed. And so as we're thinking about what kind of information would we need in this community to be able to do more reproducible research, I would, I would encourage folks to look to, to other fields that you think have done this well, or maybe haven't done this well and, and lessons to learn. So two that I put in the chat that might be useful are the brain imaging data structure. Um, I know that there's a recent initiative to expand this to quantitative MRI headed by Aga, who's on the call. Um, I think initiatives like that will be hugely useful. And then COVIDAS, which was created by the OHBM community as, as a set of reporting standards. I think even these sorts of things, which sit almost outside of the discussion of intellectual property, it's just information reporting standards that can be included in you know, any format you'd like, but making sure that that information is available will smooth over so much and will also really help with things like tool development, um, open tool development, if you'd like to do that or, or proprietary whatever makes sense. Thank you, Elizabeth. So we had a comment from uh, Alan about how to incentivize a lot of this behavior. Uh, I guess everybody can read it, but Alan, would you like to uh, say a few sure. words? Sure. Oftentimes there's not a lot of, of uh, traction for people to uh, engage in reproducibility studies. Um, the re promotional committees don't give it a lot of weight. They should. Um, so one of the ways to, to raise the profile of reproducibility studies is, is to find incentives out there. OHBM has, uh, has a reproducibility prize. You've heard about 
reproducibility lanes in publication. These are all ways to foster and, and build the importance of conducting reproducibility studies. And I, I think there's a need for that, for the journals to take a lead, for, for the universities to give greater weight to these kinds of uh, publications when uh, assessing people for promotion. Thank you. The other thing that I, that I, that I said there is that uh, in the discussion, it's not, in, in, not entirely clear to me what we mean by reproducibility. Is it reproducibility of, uh, of raw data, getting the same signal to noise, the, the, the same contrast? Or is it reproducibility of the derived data? Because the processing tools in between can serve to reduce the, uh, the variability across, say, a multi-site study. You can have much more reproducible derived results than uh, reproducible raw results. So it's important to, to define what we mean by reproducibility. And, of, and lastly, of course, um, it's precision versus accuracy. Uh, how do we define accuracy if we don't know the answer? We need validation data sets to allow us to assess tools. Thank you, Alan. And uh, last, I will ask Peter for uh, his uh, finishing thoughts. Thanks, Nicola. Um, I, I mean, some great points there. Thanks, Alan, for those points as well. Um, I mean, I think the, the one parting uh, comment that I would make, or maybe plea, is that um, I think this is going to have to be a community effort. Um, you, on this call, I guess by definition, are passionate about this. Um, my own handicap is that I am a dinosaur from the last century, and I'm going to need help um, to, to do anything about this. So I would just encourage you to get involved, and that could mean you know, getting in touch with me and helping to actually make some of these things happen, uh, going through the reproducibility study group, getting involved with them. Um, you know, I could do with your help. I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all. Uh, I'm happy that we got quite a lot of content in, you know, an hour. Uh, if uh, people want to turn on their camera, we can take a group photo. No pressure. Whoever wants to be on the photo, feel free to uh, turn it on right now. And uh, yeah, let's see how many windows we'll get. Wow. So I can't fit them all because my screen is small. It's separated in two. Does anybody have a big screen that they can uh, take uh, a joint image? I know that Tommy is Tommy's on the call. I know that he was able to do one last time. Does anybody see everybody on one screen? Krishna, you're doing it. Excellent. So you didn't tell us when to say cheese, but uh, you know, you <laughs> hopefully not many of us blink. Okay, sure. Uh, cheese. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so I really, I really appreciate the time everybody took. Uh, I, I think we succeeded on really putting a very diverse group of people together. And the scope of the discussion reflected that. And uh, hopefully we all learned something uh, in the process. Uh, big thank you to uh, the uh, people that joined on the panel. Big thank you to the editorial co-authors. And... Uh, Hope to see you again in a uh, new uh, uh, YouTube format. We might actually do something similar again uh, related to uh, MRM papers, concrete MRM papers. So uh, have a good day. Uh, whoever wants to stick around, I'll be around for another 10 or 15 minutes. But uh, this is the official part, and uh, we're wrapping it up. So have a good day, everybody.